Hey everyone, we're Nick and Rachel. If you're new here and haven't been following our adventures so far, then typically you'll find us vlogging our adventures around the world. However, this series of videos is going to be a little bit different. And the reason for that is because as we've been going through each of the countries that we've visited so far, we've realized that there are a number of things that are quite different to what we're used to in the UK and Canada. The reason that we have this channel is to share our travel experiences in the hopes of inspiring other people to travel more. With that, we want to share some tips and tricks that we've picked up along the way in each of the countries so that if you want to go and visit some of the same places, then you're armed with some helpful information and knowledge to make planning and navigating around easier. Today's video is going to be focused on traveling around South Korea. If you've been watching our videos then you'll know that we took some time in Seoul and also included a tour of the infamous DMZ. While a few pointers will be specific to these places, the rest of the pointers we're going to be providing to you will be about the country itself. We hope that you find these useful. If you're arriving in South Korea at the airport, so Incheon Airport, then you're probably going to need to get into the city. And there are two different trains that you can take to do this. The express train is about $9.50 per person, while the train that makes stops is about $5 per person. While the stopping train is definitely cheaper, the disadvantage is that it takes about twice the time. However, the train that makes all the stops is the same ticket as just for the regular metro in and around Seoul, whereas the express train is a separate ticket altogether. Once you're in Seoul, then the city is incredibly well connected. There is an extensive metro system as well as bus routes that can take you pretty much anywhere you want to go in the city. However, especially for the metro, it is worth noting that you will most likely have to purchase a new ticket for every single time that you want to get on. For this, you're going to need to use a ticket machine. The ticket machines are cash based. They don't accept international cards. And the other thing to note is that it is for a specific journey from the station that you're at to the desired destination. So with that, you will need to know the exact name of the metro station that you are planning on going ahead of you taking that journey because you will be expected to input it in order to buy your ticket. The good news though is that unlike some other countries, the ticket machines do operate in English. So with that, then the steps to be able to purchase your ticket once you know these factors is very straightforward. Single ticket trips within the center of Seoul are generally about $2 Canadian per person. But these do also include about a 50 cent deposit. Therefore, keep a hold of your ticket once you scan out and then you can feed it into this refund machine and it will provide you with that deposit right back to your pocket. South Korea in general is a very modern country and I'm specifically talking about Seoul and the area around the DMZ. So with that being said, they do generally accept all forms of payment. So cash and credit card, Apple Pay, Google Wallet, However, this is with the exception of the metro that Nick just mentioned. A slightly curious thing with regards to navigating around Seoul and the rest of South Korea is that Google Maps doesn't work especially well in the country. The reason for this is because Google do not actually have a server in South Korea. So this means that for generally being able to find information on places and getting public transport directions, then you're all set. But for anything that's more specific, like live traffic updates or walking directions or anything like that, then it's not going to be able to give you the specifics or even a route at all. As an alternative, there is a Korean app called Naver or Nava, or I never quite got the sense of how it was meant to be pronounced but it is worth noting that it is translated directly from Korean. So trying to put in English place names may be a bit of a challenge and it can be, for want of a better way of putting it, a little bit clunky for a non-Korean speaking user. 
What we ended up doing in order to get around is we still used Google to get us the transport directions for where we needed to go. And then in order to get to the appropriate sites, then we just made sure that we had our location sharing on so that we could just follow the blue dot to get to where we needed to based on the roads that we could see. So there is probably gonna to need to be a bit of map reading when you're trying to navigate around the amazing city that is Seoul. For this reason, it is important to have a data package already set up, but if you don't, then obviously make sure that you do all of this research while you have some connectivity, because obviously it will be more difficult to find where you need to go without it. Convenience stores are located everywhere and are a really good cheap alternative instead of restaurants. They provide onigiri, coffee, pop, juice, water, sandwiches, pot noodles, and even fresh fruit for a fraction of the price. So if you're on a budget, these are really helpful. The reason for this is that we were pretty excited about the prospect of eating proper restaurant food like Korean barbecue and Korean fried chicken and all of that kind of stuff when we were there. However, when we then actually turned up to these restaurants, we were pretty surprised by just how much these particular things ended up costing. And they were seemingly a lot more in line with what you'd expect to pay in North America and Europe for the same thing. So we were a little bit discouraged from restaurants. One of the things that we tried to do to kind of get away from this was to go to the famous Myeongdong night market. However, this ended up actually having a similar kind of problem. Generally speaking, although you had a lot of different little stalls which had some amazing food on offer, then generally speaking, to get something substantial from one of the stalls, then you needed to pay probably about eight Canadian dollars for the pleasure. And given that these were really generally small bites by comparison, then you probably need maybe about three to four of them to really fill you up. So even though it is a night market, then the pricing is not in line with other night markets or hawker markets that you may experience in other parts of Asia. As Nick mentioned, we were a little bit limited on what we could try due to our budget. We were priced out of Korean barbecue and Korean fried chicken. However, we were still able to try some traditional Korean food at a very reasonable price. Some of the traditional Korean foods that we did try and recommend to you are tteokbokki, sundae, and gimbap. Gimbap, by the way, is basically Korean sushi. They're definitely all worth trying, and you can even add a little bit of kimchi if you want some extra spice. One thing that we didn't quite realize until we got into Korea is that Koreans love their coffee. And because of the coffee culture that is in Korea, and specifically Seoul, then it is very, very easy to find yourself basically a vat of coffee for barely any price whatsoever with iced coffee really being the drink of choice. As an example, generally speaking, there were multiple different chains that you could use and in each of those, then it was very standard to be able to buy something about 16 to 20 ounces. So basically a pint for anything between two to three Canadian dollars per cup. In certain coffee shops though, it's worth mentioning that you could even get a 32 ounce coffee for just under $5. So let that be an indicator to you as to what you can expect while you're there. Historically, tours of the Demilitarized Zone or DMZ have included the Joint Security Area or JSA. However, while we were there, unfortunately, we were not allowed to visit the JSA, nor were any other tourists, because there had been a little bit of an international brouhaha involving a tourist crossing the border to North Korea while on a tour. And that made us really question whether it was going to be worth paying to go on a DMZ tour, because they're not cheap. However, we decided we should go ahead with it because we were really interested in the history. And all I can say is it is worth doing a DMZ tour, whether it includes the JSA or not. 
The history that you learn on this tour is amazing. And even more than that, you really gain an appreciation for the human toll that this conflict has taken. And I really think it's just worth learning about that. If you want to go a little bit further back into your history, then Seoul has a lot of temples from the feudal age. And each of these is absolutely stunning in their own right. However, I think we ended up getting a little bit palaced out because we ended up seeing about five of them within the space of two to three days. The good news with that though is that actually the majority of these only cost a thousand won, so one Canadian dollar to get in. So it is definitely cost effective to go and visit each one if you want to. But if you are pressed for time or you're just only fussed about seeing one, then we would recommend the largest one, which is called Gong Book Yang. That one I think was more like three dollars or maybe five, can't quite remember now. But that one had the largest grounds, the buildings were grander, and definitely it was a good way to spend half a day just exploring the grounds and admiring the amazing work that's gone into the buildings. Just as with many of the other countries that we visited, temples and places of worship are free to visit. However, just remember to dress appropriately and you can find the guidelines online. If there's anybody who's watching who enjoys singing or karaoke or anything like that, then you are definitely in luck with Seoul. However, if you do a Google search for karaoke bars in Seoul, you may end up coming up shorter than you expect. The reason for this is because the Korean word for karaoke is not karaoke. It is called norebang. And if you search for norebang instead, then you will find a huge number of recommendations for places to go if you want to sing your little hearts out. The best place to go for this is the Hongdae neighborhood. And there then you have your more classic style karaoke booths that we are generally accustomed to in most parts of the world. But in addition to this, then they have an interesting thing called a coin operated Norebang. And essentially this can be a room in the same way, or it can be just a little single booth. And instead of paying for X amount of time where you can just sing as many songs as you want, Instead, it's a pay per song model. And generally speaking, it's quite economical. And the good news is because you're choosing the songs and because you're paying based on song alone, then you have all the time in the world to figure out exactly which songs you would like to sing. Therefore, if you have a little bit more time on your hands or you just don't want the pressure of rushing into things when it comes to your song choices, then perhaps this would be a good alternative. And that's our list for South Korea. We recognize that we really didn't explore a huge amount of this country. So our tips have definitely been limited to just Seoul as well as going on a DMZ tour. Nonetheless, we hope our tips and tricks have been helpful and that you can apply them to any future travels. We do recognize that this is definitely not an exhaustive list for the whole country and it is restricted to a certain pocket of the country. So if you have any questions or further suggestions, please leave a comment below. Until next time though, take care. And keep smiling.